for having me here, here in beautiful Oslo, Norway. Yeah, we are here in Oslo. We're talking about Africa. Uh, you are, of course, Ethiopian originally, but uh, you live in you live in the U.S. Is that correct? Right. Or you're based right. in the U.S. Right. But you work with Africa, right? right. Uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself, uh, the work you're doing at the moment, but uh, also maybe uh, a little bit bigger picture of. Uh, you know, wh why Africa is uh, close to your heart, why in terms of investment Africa is important to you? Right. First of all, thank you for the invitation to be on this podcast. I know we've been trying to schedule this for a few months, and finally we managed to do it in this beautiful, please, <laughs> beautiful hotel room acting like a studio. And uh, you and I have known each other for a number of years. Uh, you were one of the most fascinating interviewers that I've met. So. It's just a pleasure to be working with you on this podcast. Very kind. So of you. you asked uh, what we do. Maybe I'll give you a, a very brief um, overview of what we do. Uh, you you got my name perfectly pronounced. So the Zem is for those who can't pronounce it. I always joke that only my mother pronounced my friend my first name perfectly. Zemadine, call me Zem. So I chair a Washington D.C. based investment firm an investment banking advisory firm, and also a, a private equity co company that deploys capital, both primarily private cap private equity, but we used to do a little bit of VC, not anymore, but so that's kind of what we do. Much of our business is in Africa. Now, as you indicated, I'm originally from Ethiopia. I'm what they call an Ethiopian American. So uh, my roots are in Africa. And secondly, we see opportunities. We can sniff opportunities across Africa. There's a lot happening in Africa. Yes, it has challenges, but opportunities, I think, in my view, far exceeds the, the, the risks. Now, there's the perception of risk of Africa, and then there's the reality. So we're in a position to be on the ground, to understand, to delineate between those two. It's not to minimize the real risk, but I think in our experience, we've managed well the opportunities in Africa. So what we do and how do we relate to an audience that you're trying to address? Um, we focus on five areas. Uh, one is manufacturing, agriculture, technology, um, the hotel and tourism, the hospitality business. At the moment, we only do like the infrastructure bucket of it, which includes a wide spectrum from housing to telecoms. Um, on the agriculture side, I mean, I got exciting stuff to do. I think uh, everybody knows the future of Africa. If we're going to transfer the economy, agriculture is key. We have a major initiative right now with partners from Brazil to put up a $500 million private equity fund. It's actually called the Global Financial Security Fund One. It will be based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but backed by Brazilians, uh, which have huge expertise. Because all the data that you, you mentioned and I mentioned and others about Africa, 60% 60 of arable around in Africa, in the world is in Africa. So we, we're trying to bring it alive, beyond the talk. Okay, yeah. I know, for example, the president of the African Development Bank often cite this data that says Africa imports 40 to $50 billion of food every year when you should be a net exporter. And I've been hearing this for a long time. So we've been discussing this internally and with global partners. Can we do something about it beyond the talk? And that's this fund, which we'll be launching in a couple of weeks in, in Sao Paulo in Brazil, is designed to in a meaningful address that. So that's one of the things we, we try to do is bring global capital to Africa. I can tell you where we live, where we operate. We're based in, in Washington, actually a suburb of Washington called the McLean, Virginia, but it's a suburb. We can actually see probably capital here from where we are. There's no shortage of capital in America. Mm -hmm. There's trillions, not billions, trillions of money floating around every day looking to do something. But the challenge has been to convince big institutional investors, certainly speaking, I, I can't speak about Europe, you know, I, I grew up in the US, but we know the US system very well. The challenge we found is convincing US institutional investors or even family offices of wealthy American billionaire families to part with some of that capital, to deploy some of that capital in Africa. So as I said, one, the, the, the Americans have a very distant view or uh, less than ideal information about Africa. So that, that clouds their judgment and say, why am I putting money in Africa? So institutions like us and people like us who can bridge the gap between the United States and, and in Africa. I mean, I, I went, my family and I went to the U.S. when we were very young. We grew up there. We, we succeeded in America as immigrants, but with roots in Africa. So when we could present to them in an articulate way that American institutional investors, or wealthy individuals can address, uh, can understand, I think some of that cash that is sitting really idly doing nothing, sitting in 2 3% earning a year, 
Whereas in Africa, we can show we can do 20, 22, 24% IRRs on a longer period. At the same time, be an impact investor. Agriculture is as basic as it gets. So this is the kind of stuff that, uh, that we're doing, and we're very excited about it. Obviously, here in Norway as well, we're, we're meeting with the institutional investors. Again, as you know, Norway has the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. I read some numbers up to one and a half to $1.6 trillion extremely wealthy country yeah. and the Norwegians obviously have much closer closer attachment to Africa and we were hoping to convince some of them to to co-invest with us and be impact investors in something that's as basic as food it's not a, just basic agriculture we're talking about the value addition where yeah. as you know Africa is now exporting commodities yeah. and we're trying to change that yeah okay you you've, you've hinted at uh, something that's important in, in the context of this conversation which is all of this is taking place against the backdrop. Mm -hmm. The backdrop of Africa right now, we know globally, mm -hmm. uh, th things, are, things are changing, yeah, let's put it that way. Right. Right? There's a lot of realignment going on, uh, economic centers of power are shifting, financial centers of power are shifting. Mm -hmm. Obviously, geopolitically, the world is, is in some ways quite scary, quite uncharted territory. Right. Now, we don't, we don't necessarily need to get into that, but how is that playing into sort of your approach to the continent and your approach to investment, because it's kind of interesting that you're, you're in DC, you're obviously uh, working closely with American investors, but you mentioned that we're doing agriculture with the Brazilians, right? right so right. Yeah, you got to go to Brazil to, 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 uh, to do agriculture in Africa. Right. We know that there's lots of investment out of China. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. There's more investment coming into Africa out of the Gulf states. How is that changing the picture in terms of investment and the, the opportunity set that you see in a place like Africa and sort of in, in your day-to-day -day reality? Mm -hmm. uh, how relevant is this conversation around the big picture for you? This is a very good question. Um, the reason I say that, and you, you, you really highlighted what is going on in the world, how is that benefiting or detracting Africa? I think in, in, at the moment, it's actually going to be a big plus for Africa. Geopolitics is playing a very important role. Um, I mean, as, as an American, I, I can tell you for years and years and years, we used to promote Africa and the US, and we didn't get a very receptive audience, okay? But when we start plugging in China, and we, we went around Capitol Hill and the executive branch of government and other places in the State Department, and you start raising that the role China is playing. And I have, I'm a big fan of China in terms of what has done for Africa. Yes, there are issues here and there, but I think the, the, the presence of China has changed America's view, because we've got to get real. These are the two big superpowers. Yeah. What they do matters. So the fact that China was pouring in hundreds of billions of dollars every year into Africa, a geostrategic rival of the United States, mm -hmm. then you started getting attention. Now, the Republicans lost less so than the Democrats, but I think the establishment that runs American foreign policy started to get it. And I think now there's an understanding that we can't just see China, Africa to China. I mean, that, so Africans are now playing it, hopefully, if they're smart. Uh, certainly on the private sector, we're playing that. Mm -hmm. We were saying, you know what, you need to be there. So, for example, uh, the USDFC, which has 60 billion units, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, it's not a sovereign wealth fund, but it, it mimics what China yeah. is doing and other countries are doing. Uh, they have 60 billion dollars, a lot of it to be deployed in Africa. And just a couple weeks ago, actually, I attended a session where there I had people flow, fly all the way into Africa. And this this case, it happened to be the event was held in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. which was off coverage for DFC for a number of years, and they're replicating that in Angola and other places. So. I think geopolitics, again, is starting to play a meaningful role where Africa is getting attention. Now, I gotta be honest. If you were to sit with decision makers in DC, pol political decision makers, powerful people, in the scheme of things, in the order of power or priority for the United States, uh, there's still China's number one, Europe, yeah. Middle East, Russia, it comes up, but it's still there, and all we gotta do is elevate it, even with several billion dollars extra coming out of Washington for investment, not aid, because the US is actually, I mean, as an American taxpayer, I'm happy to see um, some of my tax dollars goes to aid for countries around the world. The US on the aid side is generous, but what we were having difficulties is convincing private American companies to go deploy in Africa. Yes, the US still invests in Africa, but China has outranked it. So geopolitics is actually playing very well. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one side of it. Uh, 
I say a lot about America because I know that country, but I'm sure the Europeans can say the same thing. Now, we have other very important players, the Gulf, yeah. the UAE. The UAE is, of the six yeah. GCC countries, the UAE is by far the largest, and I'm sure the Saudis will come next. So they also see the value of engaging Africa early. All the numbers you cited, and, and I've cited all the time, the demographics, the natural resources, all that being what it is, I think overlay that with geopolitics, then for private capital, for those of us who raise private capital around the world, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to sense that there's a receptive audience, mm -hmm. unlike the past. Is it pure altruistic for them? No. It's, uh, it's to, to fend off rivals. And I think that's the, the beautiful part that I see. But Africa has to do its part as well. Okay? I mean, we got to be very honest with it. You and I are old enough to be around when Africa has been presented as the, the, the rise, the Africa rise, yes. without the nuances. Yeah. Now we need to show substance like Africa is opening up its market to their continental free trade, like the FCFTA. I think they're trying to promote intra-Africa trade, intra-Africa FDI. But the infrastructure, the, the structure within Africa of welcoming investment, both domestic private sector, but also FDI, needs to be enhanced. I mean, there's only 50 billion a year that goes into FDI, into Africa. It's nothing. No. Small co European countries uh, attract more than that. So Africa also has to take ownership for this alignment of geopolitics in its favor is realized. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key message that I have. Mm -hmm. That responsibility presumably falls almost entirely on the policymakers. Mm -hmm. who, who, who does that from the African uh, standpoint? Right. There, there are two aspects of it, actually. There's the political leadership that needs to formulate policies but need to be receptive and get feedback from the private sector. But the African private sector also has to take ownership. It, it has to be a partner. I see in a number of African countries, including you know my birth country in Ethiopia, PPP has now become the norm, public private partnerships, mm -hmm. because there's a realization that neither side can do the whole shebang by themselves. But also, again, in, in Africa, I'm hoping there'll be more trust of the private sector to take the lead than in the past where governments wanted to do it themselves. So they, the distrust it was no. huge. The gap was huge. But I'm starting to see that the reality that, that African governments say we need the private sector. We need our own domestic private sector. Again, I mean, we look at Asia. I'm a big fan of how Asia developed. My favorite book, as I mentioned in the past, is called How Asia Works. Right? We need to read those kinds of books. In the span of our lifetime, countries like Singapore went from being dirt poor, yeah. have a GDP per capita lower than most African countries, to one of the wealthiest. So one of the things I suggest is building strong institutions in Africa on the public sector side, but also the private sector taking ownership and looking at moving away from short-termism, by the way. And that's part of the challenge we face in Africa as private sectors because of a number of reasons, legitimate reasons, because of unpredictability of policies and other things, macroeconomic instabilities, African private sectors tend to have a short-term view. If we can elongate that, okay, have, again, trust between public and private sector enhanced, I think we, there's no reason why we can't be like the Asian tigers, okay? But we need, and this is a concluding point on this one question you asked me, is the four or five big countries in Africa, the anchor countries, whether it's Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, South Africa, uh, they, can, they can uplift their neighbors and then ultimately uh, the continent as a whole. I know I'm certainly speaking in Ethiopia, it's doing very well. You know, despite some challenges it's faced the last three, four years, it's grown by 7 to 8%. Mm -hmm. They're targeting 10%. But if you look at South Africa, it's under 1% for consistently. Now they have a new coalition government, perhaps. Nigeria, 2 3%. I mean, the biggest economy in Africa. So these, these, these two, three other countries, I mean, they, if they can grow. And as I said, I use Ethiopia as an example. Despite challenges, it's grown, and maybe if the others. Then we can uplift. That's how Asia, when China grew, when India grew, yeah. you know how that works, right? They uplifted the Southeast Asian countries. And the same thing, these anchor economies, these anchor countries can uplift. And that's the kind of stuff that we need to promote more of so that Africa as a whole could become, what is it, $3 trillion GDP today. It's okay, but yeah. why not $20, 30 $40 yeah. trillion? I mean, that's, and that's, that's what we're hitting. Yeah, we're in first gear. Uh, I mean, yes, in, exactly. In, in, uh, out in of five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if not more, to be honest with you. And look, look, you're absolutely right, of course. Uh, right. We. Ultimately, we want the entire continent to do well, but right. uh, in a realistic way, it has to be driven by certain economies. Right. You mentioned China. Imagine 
Asia without China. I mean, <laughs> you know, the Americas without the U.S., right? So yeah. if, if those aren't firing, if those economies aren't firing on all cylinders, it's mm. going to be very difficult. Now, Ethiopia, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Ethiopia, sure. not least because um, <laughs> you're, you're, you are from Ethiopia originally. Right. Um, it's kind of a fascinating country in many ways, not least because I think at the moment it illustrates the the almost inflection point that Africa seems to be at because right. Ethiopia has just joined the BRICS yes and for many reasons that's mm. very good news for, for Ethiopia I would say yeah. at the same time the country's just had a sovereign default mm. it's desperately trying to get a deal with the IMF it's almost like the country's being pulled in two directions on the one hand you have the opportunity of being a part of this mm very quickly rising group of countries. On the other, you're having to deal with structural, the, pro, the, the specter of structural adjustment. Right. What's your sense of, of where Ethiopia sits right now? Because um, it, I mean, is, it, is, is this a fair observation that, that there's kind of almost like two, two currents at the moment right. for the country? Um, what, what is, you know, how, do you, how do you deal with that, frankly, if you are you know, a country like Ethiopia right now? Well, I'm glad you asked me about Ethiopia. Obviously, I have a lot of attachment to Ethiopia. I was born there, lived there until I was in mid my teens. I'm an Ethiopian American, so I have attachments to both countries. But certainly, I think we can now contribute more to Ethiopia's development because the U.S. is a very, very wealthy country. Uh, so let me give you a quick snapshot, maybe a 15-second snapshot. Ethiopia today, we're numbers guys, so I think first I relate to that, and then we go to the details. Um, it's the second most populous country after Nigeria. Uh, just saw new data a couple of days ago. It's 132 million people, adding 3 million to its population every single year. So it's, it's a rapidly growing population that Ethiopia has. But the beautiful part of it is what we call the demographic advantage. The median age is under 20, out of 132 million Ethiopians. It's a very, very young population. So something like 70% is under 30. So this is a huge workforce. I mean, I relate it to India and China. They use that large population that they have to propel them into the second largest in the case of China and the fifth largest economy in the case of India in a span of 20, 30 years. And I think Ethiopia has that opportunity to, to marshal, to, to mobilize this young workforce, talent, workable, educatable, willing to work, to propel it into um, a middle-income country and obviously eventually in our lifetime an upper-income country. That's the demographic side of it. In terms of its GDP, this is the remarkable part. I, I started going to Ethiopia about 25 years ago. The first time I went was in 98. In the last 23, 24 years, the economy has grown by 1,900%, from about 10 billion or less to 210 billion wow. today. Now, by African standards, large numbers, but when you consider the potential, and um, there's a new forecast by Goldman Sachs, the, the 25 largest economies in the next 50 years. And they have another more nearer forecast in the next 25 years. Today's 200 billion. Goldman Sachs says by 2020, in 25 years, it will be 1.6 trillion. And by another 25 years, it will be the 16th largest economy in the world at 6.2 trillion. The 6.2 trillion, to give you a perspective, is bigger than the Saudi economy at that time, much bigger than the Turkish economy. This is Goldman Sachs. These are you know, smart people deploying capital around the world. So this is not some you know, government figures or something like that, or not even IMF numbers. These are the people who deploy capital around the world, who advise clients to where to go and invest, are saying this is the kind of forecast that they see. And of course, the population will be something like 200 and 50 million mm -hmm. by that time. So these are these are big numbers. So how do we make it happen? I think is where Ethiopia is. You mentioned a couple of numbers uh, at an inflection point in terms of economic transformation. Absolutely. Yeah. For the first, say, 20, 25 years from 91 till about late 2018 or so, 25 years, it followed what's called the developmental state economic model, very similar to China, similar to, but as you know, that that model has a finite life. I mean, it's initially designed like China did when there was no private sector. Mm -hmm. The state led everything, all the capex. Yeah. The t it was the fastest growing economy in Africa for 15 years in a row. But a lot of it is capex and government expenditures. Yeah. So now what Ethiopia has done in the last five, six years is we're going to move on to where the private sector is going to take more of the responsibilities. And actually, right now, it's purely 80, 90% of the growth is going to expect it to come from 
Ethiopian private sector, domestic, as well as foreign direct investment. So, so the private sector has been given, this is the pivot point or the inflection point that I think you're referring to. And then I give you some numbers, which is exciting for us because we deploy capital there as well. Uh, two years ago, private um, financial uh, financing, loans from banks and all that, 80% was going to government or government-owned enterprises. This year, it just flipped. 80% goes to private sector. Okay. So there's, there's this handshake, yeah. handover to the private sector. It's a delicate thing because it takes a little bit of uh, understanding what, what, because when it was the state running everything, when everything was coming from state-owned enterprises or government expenditure, it was easy to, to manage it. But now you're, you're handing it over to the private sector. So the institutional infrastructure has to go with that. So that's what, Having said all this, if you look at the last four years with COVID, 2020, and then the internal conflict we had in another part of the country, um, the IMF, if you look at the IMF database, and I've, I've seen it just yesterday, it's grown by anywhere between 6.2 to 7.2% in that period. Double the African average. And after for the five largest economies in Africa, has been consistently number one. Yeah. For, for the last four years, with all the challenges Despite that the country... All of that, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're looking at is now when some of the challenges are now becoming headwinds, you see clarity in the opportunity. I mean, I'll give you a clear example. We're, we are, I chair, I'm, I'm the chairman of a big multinational company in the closing business that is invested in Ethiopia. Uh, we have 1,500 employees. We export 100% to Europe. And what we've seen is if you invest the right way, uh, you can actually outcompete China, Vietnam, and Bangladesh in the sector that we're in, which is the garment, the closing business, okay? And that's what we've seen. Productivity is 90% of our, our Ethiopian factory. Productivity is 90% of our Italian factory with a much labor, labor cost yeah. because we're in Africa, we're in Ethiopia. We pay living wages actually above, above, where we, above average wages in Ethiopia. So there's that opportunity. But this one thing you mentioned about the default of mm -hmm. the sovereign wealth, the one euro bond, but I want to put that in context as well. Um, I'll call it a selective default you know, by design in collaboration with creditors. Um, interestingly, since that happened a few months ago, I would put a default in quotation. I mean, obviously it was by agreement. Uh, it has reached uh, debt restructuring uh, with sovereign partners, bilaterals. Mm -hmm. It's now negotiating with the one euro bond creditors. But the most important thing, a month ago, Ethiopia received the largest amount of funding, financing by the World Bank and IMF combined for any African country except Egypt. So if you look at all of the totality of Africa, $20 billion. It's a very large yeah. sum. With yeah. another 4.9 billion, almost 5 billion uh, expected soon from debt and renegotiation. So we're looking at $25 billion of FX liquidity being injected in Ethiopia over the next three years. These institutions, as you know, the Bretton Woods institutions, they don't give you even a billion, let alone 20 billion. And that's what Ethiopia got a month ago. But part of an economic reform program, part of the legacy, you know, it used to be a socialist communist country until 1991, which destroyed all the fabrics of private sector. And now we're re regaining that. And some of the policies, procedures that, that, that was held over from the past had to be removed, for mm -hmm. example. We just, Ethiopia just announced a free float of its currency. It's the first time in 50 years. So a lot of the thing that was holding back investors, for example, how do I get remittance and my dividends out because there's a closed exchange market, is now going by the wayside. The opening up the, foreign, the banking sector to foreign banks. First time in 50 years. I mean, last time foreign banks were in Ethiopia was Emperor Haile Selassie mm -hmm. was running with the king of Ethiopia in 1974. So a lot of big reforms were happening. Yeah. So I know you picked up on the default thing, but that was one minor piece of, of, of a bigger reform agenda. And I think I'm very hopeful. That we look at the, the forecast this year from the IMF is 7%. The Ethiopian government has close to 8.1%. Over the next 10 years, they're averaging about 10% growth. So a lot of reforms are happening, but a lot of work also. It's what I call the economy is a work in progress. A lot of changes from the legacy to this new phase where the private sector is going to rule. Final point on the sort of because we look at markets, FDI. If you look at five years in a row, the UNCTAD report that comes out every year, Ethiopia has been the top five recipients of it, despite all these challenges. Mm -hmm. So imagine when we have clarity yeah. as we go forward. Yeah. We're very optimistic, and that's why you know um, we put money in there. We put private capital from around the world in Ethiopia. 
Well, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about you, Zim, is uh, context and nuance <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in the analysis. And I, I think when it comes to a country like Ethiopia, a, a, a continent like Africa, it is so important to understand the context and the right. nuance. Right. It's so easy to get drawn into the tropes and cliches. Mm. Um, and this is not to sugarcoat anything. You know, it, right. of course, it's difficult. There are complexities. There are real issues that need to be dealt with. But um, it's not this one-dimensional or two-dimensional place or story. And Ethiopia, I think, epitomizes that. One thing I want to... Uh, just pick your brain on before we wrap up mm. uh, on the topic of context is and this is back to the geopolitics that we spoke about earlier yes I completely agree with you there's a lot of opportunity and advantage in that especially if you know how to play that mm. if you're smart about it right uh, I think you nailed it when you said if if it wasn't for China the U.S. would not be right. talking about investing in Africa today. Right. That's just, I think, historical historical fact. Mm. Uh, that's the plus side. The downside, of course, is with geopolitical competition comes all sorts of dirty business. Mm. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and that can go as you know from from proxy wars to meddling in countries to trying to play countries off against each other in Africa. Are you concerned about the, 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 the risks that come from this geopolitical uh, image that's emerging, this picture that's emerging? Uh, some call it a multipolar world, some call it a bipolar world. Hmm. I think many agree that it's a more fractured world than, than we were in even just four or five years ago. Should we be, how nervous should we be, put it that way, from an African standpoint? So listen, I mean, these are very interesting comments and thoughts that you're, you're provoking, actually. <laughs> Um, for Africa to benefit from this new rivalry, or is it has to take ownership uh, itself? Okay. Yes, you see opportunities coming, and you say, "What have we done to be prepared?" On two fronts. Uh, even that session you chaired uh, today, I mentioned this. First thing on the political side of it, unity. I mean, we can't let the outside divide you. And then that's the, so through, whether it's through the African Union or other mechanisms, now they, they, they have a seat, Africa is going to have a seat in the G20. There's a proposal that Africa should have a seat in the UN Security Council without a veto. I don't know why it's without a veto when they have one and a half billion people. But still, you, you're now getting seat at the table. Yeah. You're not a recipient of decisions We're actually anymore. having that conversation. It's actually happening, which is already a big step, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's the point. So Africa should be ready to uh, leverage mm -hmm. the, because they, Africa fought very hard to get a seat at the G20. It's fought very hard for years and years to get a seat at the UN. And many other places where decisions are made, Africa is getting a seat. It's, the question is, are we going there as unanimous, mm -hmm. united? But that's what it is. I mean, look at here in Europe. I mean, there are one as a European Union, and maybe Norway is not a member, but they all have yeah. some certain common values that they fight for together and they get a seat at the table, right? Uh, maybe Africa will get a permanent seat, uh, I don't know, at the IMF and World Bank. I mean, they have board seating as, as a group, but so that opportunity is presenting itself. So unanimity as one front, not being divided as well. On the economic front, Africa has actually an even better opportunity through the Africa Continental Free Trade, which is opening up its borders. As I said, the African GDP today is $3 trillion. You know, with a T, it might sound like a lot, but there's 54 countries, okay? It's smaller than the, yeah. the UK GDP yeah. or the French economy. So what we need to do then is stop acting like the competition is with another African country. It ain't. It's not. Competition is China. Competition is yes. Vietnam. Competition yes. from all over the world. Your brother next door, your African neighbor from, is just like you. If you don't collaborate, if you, if you become territorial, you fend off as if like somebody coming offshore from the Afri outside the African continent, you remain small. I mean, again, speaking from, from a private sector perspective, multinationals, big investors, fund managers, they don't look at just one country when they invest in mm -hmm. Africa. They want the regional approach, if possible, an African approach. Then the critical mass is attractive. So Africans need to be, I use the example, one, one sector that we are heavy into, which as to illustrate the challenges that we, we are heavy into the airline business in Africa. But to fly from one African country to another, I need what's called bilaterals, as opposed to a free skies agreement. Even though the laws, heads of state signed this, we can replicate this in many other ways. So on the economic front, we need to open up smartly differentiate between African investors and foreign investors and give preferentials to the Africans so that we can grow together. 
on the political side, as I mentioned, you know, united. Don't be divided. Don't do bi by the way, don't do bilaterals. Okay? When you are a member of the African Union. Yeah. Okay? Don't be bilaterals when you are a member of the FCFT with other with the US or I don't men mention African countries who are starting to do that. It undermines the cohesiveness that we're in it together uh, approach. So mm -hmm. these are just some of the messages, but it's a fantastic opportunity. It's not like 10, 15 years ago when it's just a slogan, Africa rising. It's actually real. Many things yeah. that will drive the future economy of, uh, from lithium to everything else is in Africa, but it's not being exploited. So I think this is, for me, an exciting time to be in Africa. And the bigger economies, I think, as I said, mentioned, they, they can uplift the rest of the countries around. And then we can see the next China, as Ethiopia has referred to, or Nigeria, the superpower of, of Africa, can become a real one. I'll get real attention. Uh, you know, we, we, we were both there through Africa Rising, and, right. I, and I think anybody who was honest with themselves understood at the time that, you know, this is not what it's cracked up to be. And I, I think in many ways you could argue it was premature. It, <laughs> was, it, was, it was a slogan to get attention, but the substance underneath it yeah. was not really well developed or thought out. But I, I think you're absolutely correct that this time, this is, a, this is very, yes. very different. Yes. What we're talking about here is a truly, I mean, it's not a generational um, uh, opportunity. I mean, it's an opportunity for the, for the next century yeah. at the very least. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done, but yes. it can be done, and I think that's the key. Zem, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for taking the time. I uh, really appreciate the insight. Um, it, took, it took a while to get this organized, but yeah. better late than never. It was well worth it. Uh, who knows? Maybe we can schedule another follow-up in six <laughs> months or so and uh, pick up the conversation from there. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Zem. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you.